click. There we go. The spiritual teacher Ram Das wrote, we're all just walking each other home. This simple truth is a call to humility, to connectedness, to the awareness that we're all walking a path to some destination where we feel seen and heard and accepted and safe. We're all just walking each other home. But what if that was our purpose and our intention every day, just to walk each other home? How would we be different? How would our friendships be different? How would the world be different? And what does that mean anyway to walk each other home and why should we? I believe that our individual friendships, the health of our individual friendships, drives the health of society because society is a collection of relationships. And so how we manage our individual relationships rolls up to create our culture to shape our society where right now, judgment and public shaming are blood sport. And so we have only ourselves to look to for responsibility for how we treat each other. We have to look to ourselves to change this path that we're on. But how? We learn to walk each other home. Now as a life coach, I make a living walking people home. And after 10 years of conscious daily practice, I'm still learning how to do it. And this is what I've learned so far. Before I could walk anybody home, I had to, I had to start inside myself. I had to do the emotional intelligence work of cultivating self-awareness. Now, trust me, I could have gone the rest of my life without doing this work. People survive without it. They have friends, they have dinner parties. I had friends, I had dinner parties, but I wanted something more. I wanted the feeling of ease and connection that you only get with a deep friendship. One where you're growing together and you really understand how to walk each other home. So I learned. I learned that if I wanted to have amazing, present, open-hearted friends, I would have to be an amazing, present, open-hearted friend, and that would require me to do something different honestly a lot of things different but today I'm just going to share with you my top three self-awareness lessons for friendship dropping agenda suspending judgment and letting go of story and if you want to play along just think of a friendship that's important to you and maybe everything's always gone swimmingly with it but maybe once in a while something feels off and if you think about what feels off see if it doesn't align with one of these three things Agenda, judgment, or story. The first thing I had to learn was how to drop my agenda for my friends. Actually, first I had to have the self-awareness to recognize that I had an agenda. An agenda is a to-do list that I've made up for someone else to do. <laughs> I only want you to be happy. I just want you to find a great guy. I want you to get a wonderful job. That's agenda. I want this for you. But how do we execute our agendas? We give advice. You know advice. That's when the word should falls out of your mouth without even thinking about it. You should dump that loser and move on. You should quit that soul-sucking job. They don't deserve you. Well-meaning, yes, but trust me, the road to friendship is paved with shoulds. <laughs> so here's the epiphany. If my agenda is what I want for you, it's not really for you, is it? It's for me. If you do this or stop doing that, then I won't have to watch you suffer. I can tell you how to fix it with my awesome advice and we can both be happy. <laughs> advice is about alleviating our own suffering, our own pain. Nobody wants to see a friend hurting, so we tell them what they should do. At a time when silence would probably be better, we give them advice so we can feel relieved 
so we can be helpful. If I'm holding an agenda for you or giving you advice, I'm not walking you home. Now the fix for this is self-awareness. I gotta catch myself in the act and then use a simple turnaround designed to keep me in my own business. Whatever I say I want for her, I substitute me. I want me to be happy. I want me to be in a loving relationship. I want me to have a great job. Now I've recognized that I've been projecting my own fears and longings onto her, my own idea of what life should be like, and if I drop that agenda, I can go back to walking her home. Now the second thing I had to learn was to suspend judgment. Not easy for a gal from New York. <laughs> judgment is covert. Because even though I'm, I'm guessing every one of you in here would recognize a judgment when you saw one, we don't always recognize how quickly and how harshly we do the judging. We've been doing it so unconsciously for so long, we barely even notice it. Self-awareness will allow you to notice judgment as it's happening, which is pretty much all the time. Our brains are wired for judgment. So this is a full-time job. And my judgments, I'm embarrassed to tell you, say a whole lot more about me than I would like you to know because our negative reactive judgments are simply projections of our shadow sides. Those parts of ourselves that we deem so unacceptable, we are unwilling to see them in ourselves, so we despise it in others instead. We call it out in others. She's pathetic. She's a control freak. She's a doormat. God, she's so annoying. And ironically, we knew, as kids, we knew these were projections, didn't we? What we used to say, I know you are, but what am I? <laughs> Life coaches say, you spot it, you've got it. <laughs> we reveal our negative judgments. We reveal our shadow sides through our judgment. And if you want to check out this theory, just go on to social media and think about what all that name calling really means. Now the cure for judgment came to me from a Buddhist teacher I met who said that for every judgment I make, I had to add the words, and I am that too. This way I would be replacing judgment with compassion, with connection. She's too sensitive, and I am that too. What an asshat. And I am that, too, because surely there have been times in my life where I've reacted badly out of extreme tenderness or behaved like a jerk. You're too judgmental, and I am that, too. <laughs> Just walking home. The third thing I had to do was to distinguish between a fact and a story. A story is a whole narrative based on a few facts. And stories are, stories are insidious because we've convinced ourselves that they are facts, but they're not. The stories we tell ourselves are the source of all our unease, all our inner conflict, because on some level, we know they're not true. The stories Hang on. <laughs> right. Now I'm going to tell you about all the stories I've made up over the years. Can you see why I wanted to forget that? <laughs> I've made up a lot of stories over the years, all about friends or coworkers or family who have done me wrong. And I like to start my stories with a little blame. Well, she. I toss in a should, an always, a never, and I like to demonstrate my outstanding mind reading capabilities. <laughs> Goes something like this. She never asks me how I'm doing. She doesn't care. It's always gotta be about her. 
She never invites me to those girls' nights. She knows I want to be included. She's taking cooking classes now. She's always competing with me. <laughs> the truth is, my feelings are hurt. I feel small or needy or marginalized or scared. But I'd rather tell a story about her than face my own <laughs> vulnerability. Now, the fix for storytelling comes from a Buddhist teacher, Pema Chodron, who suggests that in difficult moments, instead of telling a story, we simply stop and ask ourselves, can I be with this? Without judging the situation or blaming someone for it, or with, without that narrative, can I simply be with what's present? with curiosity. What is this that I'm experiencing? And that's how we let go of story. We reconnect to our own experience, to our own emotions, so we can see what's feeling tender or unworthy or unloved. If we can name what we're feeling, we can drop the cover story and go back to walking each other home. But it's not as easy as it sounds because we've been told over the years to avoid expressing certain emotions. We've been taught to avoid expressing bad feelings, stick to the emotional, the approved emotional script, positive feelings only. We've been told again and again how not to feel. Don't be angry. Oh, don't be sad. Don't be so sensitive. It's just locker room talk. These are times we need to walk each other home. And I like to think about walking each other home in terms of how we hold the space for others to walk with us. How many of you have never heard the term holding space in this context before? Okay, how many of you heard it and are still wondering what the hell it means? <laughs> okay. Holding space is simply about witnessing another person's troubles, their pain, their joys, their triumphs. Holding space is about creating the conditions for someone to tell you what it's like to be them in this moment of their lives, in this moment of the world. And friendship's sole task is to do this, to hold space. To hold space for them to be who they are, not who you'd like them to be. To witness. To witness. With compassion which actually creates conditions that are free of agenda, free of, judge, of judgment, and free of story. The 14th century poet Hafiz wrote, Troubled? Then stay with me, for I am not. I'm not troubled by your troubles. I can be fully present for you while you experience them, but as a witness, not an advisor. Now, holding space is like, it's like you've got a friend, and she's got some stuff in her house that she needs to put someplace. So you show up with this big bag. <laughs> now, you can't just leave the bag there for her. You've got to physically open it up and hold that space open so she can put whatever she wants in this bag. And I like to bring a big bag <laughs> just so that I can hold everything that my friends might have. All right. So now your hands are busy. You've got to hold this bag open so you can't run around and pick up her stuff for her. You can't point at something and say, hey, what are you holding on to that for? Or, hey, what are you getting rid of this for? I could, I'd kill her have one of those. And you can't wrinkle up your nose in disgust at whatever nasty bits she's putting in the bag. You remain untroubled by her mess. Just holding the bag open alleviates her struggle. And you're not exhausted by the effort. This is empathy with healthy boundaries. Just hold the bag open. But that doesn't mean you're left holding the bag. <laughs> it's her stuff. So when she's done, it's up to her to decide to take it to the curb, store it in the attic, or lay it out on the floor and sit in it again. That's how we'll change the world. We can be catalysts for social change, one friendship at a time. 
listening without agenda, witnessing without judgment, holding space without a story, being with whatever's there, finding those connections we've been longing for, making a difference in someone's life simply by walking her home. So let's start a movement. Let's make this our purpose and our intention every day to walk each other home. Let's walk each other past the scary feelings, past the feelings that are hard to feel, to that place where we feel seen and heard and accepted and safe. Let's just walk each other home. Thank you. Grab my water.